again, we see that gap. 2017, you see the same trend. There's, there's a gap in that age class. So fast forward to 2018, 2019, there's going to be a lot of age uh, two or three, or younger fish, age two fish, but we're not going to have a lot of the uh, older fish for, uh, so we don't know how that's going to impact the reproduction of LA. We don't know how that's going to impact the recruitment of LA from Lake Ontario. So the objectives of my study was to document the oocyte development in these H2 LF. And for the purpose of my study, H2 LF I'll be referring to as 106 to 145 millimeters. We, we basically got that using otolith and length frequency data from the USGS. So that's how we, we were able to age fish. Um, now we're documenting that development through the gonadosomatic index as well as systemorphic changes. And I basically want to know that are these H2 LA able to reproduce? <clears throat> so to do this, we collected fish from October 2017 to 2018. In uh, sites, or at, at times the fish were spawning, they were, as I said earlier, they were spawning near shore. So we were able to get them uh, with sains and uh, electroshocking, boat electroshocking. That was in sites at Bald Eagle Creek Marina, Hamlin Beach State Park, and uh, the Rochester Charlotte Beach Park. And then at, when the fish were at depths where we couldn't reach with those methods, basically any other time other than the spawning season, the New York DEC and the USGS helped us with uh, bottom trolls and, and got us some fish. So here we have the Rochester site, Fairhaven, Oswego, and Point Peninsula. So when we got these fish, we had to bring them back to the lab uh, alive or fresh so that we could actually do a histology on them. If you freeze them, uh, the tissue basically breaks down and they won't be easily readable under a microscope later on. So when we got them, we took the body weight, the length, and the gonad weight. We also extracted their oil so we could confirm the ages later on. We were then able to calculate the gonadosomatic index or the GSI. Um, we also did some fertilization, so we were able to cross different age groups of alloys. Uh, and then we basically measured that by counting the embryo survival to the pigmented eye stage, which was about 48 hours after uh, fertilization. The histology was a bit more involved. Uh, I had a lot of prep work involved with that, where we fixed the gonads and bones solution, embedded them in a paraffin uh, wax block, and then cut with a microtome, and then used different dyes uh, that I have labeled here the hematoxylin kind of looks more purple, or the eosin gives you that more reddish color. Uh, and then we were able to basically observe the slides, classify the oocytes based on their maturation, and then we could also measure them. And essentially that allowed me to look at the distribution of size as well as the stage as a percent. Um, and that was all the female fish. I also briefly looked at some male fish to observe the maturity of the testes to see if they too were able to uh, reproduce. Uh, and then all this done, uh, the measurements were done with image J, the uh, image processing software. So here we have some different stages of oocytes that I looked at, or that were present in this study. Uh, stage one is a pre-vitelogenic oocyte, is what we called it. Uh, that's classified with basically um, the lack of cortical alveoli. Uh, the cortical alveoli show up in stage two, and there are these uh, vesicles here. Uh, in stage two are endogenous vitelogenesis. These cortical alveoli are around the perimeter, as you can see, and there's nothing in them yet. Uh, as we move on to stage three, the cortical alveoli begin to fill with vitelogen, and uh, at stage four, that you, you get the as much vitiligen as you need in the oocyte, and the nucleus begins to migrate. It's kind of hard to see on this picture, I apologize, but the uh, oocyte migrates to the uh, perimeter, or the nucleus migrates to the, uh, else, the perimeter of the oocyte. So to touch on the GSI, we have our age three plus fish in the uh, gray color. So that's fish age three and older, and then the age two fish in the red. We see that the GSI is pretty similar throughout the time. A little bit of a difference here, but the main thing that I want to point out is that in July, you see the peak GSI, and that's when they're spawning. That was confirmed with what we saw out in the field. Another thing that's going to hint us to that is this large variation that we see in the GSI. Because so many individuals are, have spawned already, some individuals have not. So that's going to let us know that July is in fact the spawning season, and it's going to show us that 
H2 fish, because it's very similar to the older fish, that they were indeed spawning as well. <clears throat> For these guys here, it's I looked at the um, over I looked at over classification. So each bar is the percent of fish that showed the most advanced stage of oocytes. So before I get into it, I kind of want to explain that a little better. All so 100% of these fish, the most advanced stage of the oocyte was pre-vitelligenic or stage one. And this right here, we've got most of the fish, the most advanced stage present was stage one, but a, a, a small percentage, about 10%, did show that stage two. Now that 10% also had the subsequent stages in their ovary, but that's how I classified them. So what I, what I want to point out here is that, again, we see a, a rapid, uh, from June to July, <clears throat> we see a, basically a rapid uh, development of different stages and where these are the more advanced stages showing that they're ready to um, reproduce and we also see some different batches in here. So the distribution of oocyte size of H2 LA, uh, this is also going to touch on the different batches that we see uh, within a fish. So in October we see just a single batch here of uh, stage one oocytes and then as, as we go on through time we're starting to see more uh, more batches develop, and it's, it's really easy to see here in uh, late July with the higher G GSI, where you have a batch of pre-vitelogenic oocytes, a batch or stage one, a batch of uh, stage two oocytes here, and the endogenous vitelogenesis, and then some final maturation, a batch of final maturation oocytes as well. So when we go back to the data in October, and, and I didn't include this, but you, what you'll see is if for October 2019, you'll see the exact same thing as October 2018. So that's showing that this batch here and this batch here, two separate batches, had are likely to have been <coughs> spawned to get back to this original single pre-vitelogenic stage or batch. As I stated, we briefly uh, looked at the maturation of male alewife, and uh, we saw here that um, the, this dark purplish shows that there was spermatozoa present, which means that the H2 alewife were, the H2 male alewife were indeed able to spawn. And that was confirmed with some of the fertilization work that we did. We were able to cross uh, H5 plus uh, females with uh, H2 males, and we did have uh, this successful fertilization. We also were able to successfully uh, fertilize female H2 alewife with male H2 alewife. And as you can see here, we did have some embryos to the uh, eye stage develop. And that's where our hatching phase where we uh, fertilized with her, where we incubated the eggs and all that. So in conclusion, I, I, we can confidently say that H2 alewife are able to contribute to the spawning stock. Um, we, were all, we're, we can also say that they're likely multiple spawners because we saw those different stages of development within the oocytes, and we saw the different batches of oocytes. We also noticed that in H2 alewife, final maturation of the oocyte itself occurs around 600 microns. And the limitations of this study, uh, as you might have noticed through some of my figures, is probably the sample size. Uh, it's, it's extremely tough to get spawning alewife, uh, as we found out. But we were able to get uh, enough to show a little bit of results, I suppose. Um, again, for the future, this is part of my master's thesis. So what I will be doing is these analyses on older fish and then comparing those results to see uh, how the reproductive potential compares between age two alewife and older alewife. Um, we're also gonna confirm the ages that I used uh, with the help of the USGS using OLIS that I extracted previously. And I also have some uh, subsamples of eggs uh, that I'm hoping to do some fecundity work on. Uh, before I head out, I, I do wanna bring up this graph that uh, Brian White has show showed me. And this kind of touches on why are age two alewife spawning? Um, when we do ecology, most of the time, we kind of get a snapshot of a certain time period. So right now, I can say that H2O is responding. I don't know if they had always been spawning in Lake Ontario. I don't know if they always will be in the future. But something interesting to think about is this line here showing the weight of H2O over time has been increasing. 
And if you kind of trace it back to where H3 alloys were in the past, it shows that H2 alloys are nearly as large or, or by weight or as large as H3 alloy used to be. So it could be that H2 alloys are it's new and they're spawning now because they're larger. It could be, and that could be, why they're larger in Lake Ontario, it could be a whole slew of things from the introduction of zooplankton like Bethany Trepes or even climate change warming the water so they say they're going to go to their extent of their range. So that's just something to think about uh, as we go on. But with that, I would like to acknowledge my funding sources as well as all of the uh, undergrads that, that helped me and uh, faculty at SUNY Brett. 